Now let's stand and read God's Word this morning. Always a lot of announcements, aren't there? That means there's some good things happening, so we're excited about that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. We're going to talk about Christmas number 2 today. You do know the Bible talks about two Christmases. And we're going to talk about the second one today. This is the evidence of God's, of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to replay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. When He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because of our testimony to you was believed. And to this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. you may be seated. I don't know if it's me, but I, I, I sense there's a little bit of Christmas hangover in the house. Would, would you agree? You know, it wasn't enough just to, to have Christmas and eat all that stuff we eat at Christmas, right? Those special things, like all, that, all those sweets and, and, you know, seasonal dishes that we just sort of get off on that because they're really good. But then we have to shovel snow for a whole day, basically. At least that's what I did in different spots. And so it's, it's just, you know, I don't know. Christmas hangover is kind of there. And I, I think I took two naps on Christmas Day for some reason and went to bed early. So I'm catching up on my sleep. And I don't know about you, but I think you need some, some motivation today, don't you? you? You need some encouragement. You need, you need to, to, to get excited about something. And, and we got something for you this morning as we look at God's Word. I, I don't know, can you remember in your life the last awestruck moment you had? Do you remember the last awestruck moment you had in your life? In other words, it was that jaw-dropping experience that totally blew you away. Something entered your field of vision that completely overwhelmed you. It left you speechless, right? Left you in wonder or awe. The event was, as the modern language lingo says, the event was so surreal right? Surreal. Uh, that you had a hard time believing what you were seeing. I mean, it could have been, it could be in a, for parents, the birth of your first child. For me, that was kind of like, uh, it's all happening. This is, this is, this is amazing. This is marvelous. This is beyond belief. Or it might have been a breathtaking, scenic view. I don't know. I, I always used to have that jaw-dropping experience because you didn't see this very often when we lived in Tacoma, Washington, because it rained all the time. It was cloudy a lot. But when the sun came out and the clouds cleared, you could see this massive mountain standing before you called Mount Mary Rainier. And what, what, what made it so awe-inspiring is all the other mountains were like this, and then whoop, it was like that. You know, It was huge and snow-covered, and it was just like something. You, just, you drive in the trees, and all of a sudden you come around a corner. Boom, there's Mount Rainier. You, you couldn't look at it too long or you'd get in an accident, right? Because you had to keep your eye on the road. But it was, it was just awe-inspiring. Or if you've ever been to Yosemite Na- National Park, you've been to, saw the half dome sitting out there from a different view or one of the, 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 the waterfalls there is, is one of those kind of, you know, wow, one of those awe experiences. Maybe, maybe you had the opportunity to go to an air show and watch planes, uh, military planes fly over. We, we were in North Dakota um, and they had this little air show. It was really little. It wasn't like Oshkosh or anything. Uh, the, 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 the highlight of the show was a B-1 bomber flew over, right? And you're thinking, all these people were, just, were, out, were out there with the kids. They were little. 
and you can see that bomber coming in this is and it's it's a little bit lower than what you normally see for the bomber but you can't hear it you can see it coming they're 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 <clears throat> they're in contact with the cockpit of the B1 bomber and it's coming over the loudspeaker system of the airborne and you can see it coming but you can't hear it and it keeps coming it gets closer and this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger and all of a sudden when it's right on you, boom, you know, that the jets just like, you know, rumble the whole place, shake you to, and, uh, and then it goes by you and it just gets louder and louder and louder and louder. Just going, wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty awe-inspiring. That's pretty neat. The way that thing can fly and you can't even detect its sound until it's, it's right on you and almost past you. And then you hear the rumble, uh, thunderous noise of those jets that power this, this massive plane. Maybe, maybe the awe experience of your life that that jaw dropping dropping moment came in September 11th of 2001 when you woke up in the morning and you went did that just happen did they just fly those planes into those into those buildings there's there's a lot of sort of awe experiences that that accompany life and whatever Whatever inspiring, awe-inspiring, breathtaking, earth-shaking experiences you might have had in life, I want to tell you that there is none that compares to the one that's coming when Jesus Christ returns. Nothing in life that you've ever said, wow, or whoa, or awe, that's, or awesome, is going to compare to when Jesus Christ returns. And so this morning I want you to turn your Bibles to one verse, just one verse. Second Thessalonians 2 or 1 verse 10. Now, we already went through most of this passage. I went through a sermon sermons on a lot of these verses. I even included this verse in one of the sermons. And then I went back to my box of sermons. I got this huge box of sermons. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years, right? And uh, um, there were, there were times when I did this when I didn't have a really fancy computer. So I saved all my sermons in little paper notes, right? So I had this Second Thessalonians because I did it a long time ago. And I started the series and I didn't have all my notes. So I was kind of working through it. And one night I made a discovery in my basement on the floor. I, I went back to the box, the sermon box, and I found this sermon called The Awesome Day of Christ's Return. And I said, you know, I didn't do that sermon. And so I want to do this sermon today because it's truly amazing. And I think it's great timing for a message like this coming on the heels of our celebration of Christ's first coming at Christmas that we immediately go to the Christmas we're all waiting for, right? Because you know when Jesus came the first time, there were certain people who were very much attuned to what Scripture had said that Christ was coming. The Old Testament prophets said, you know, from Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, 14, about a virgin conceiving, giving birth to a son. And you're going to call his name Emmanuel. We, we had the, all the way back to Genesis 3, 15, about the, the, the woman being with child and, you know, being the, uh, conceived of the of of the woman, not uh, the child being conceived of the woman, not being conceived of a man. There was this promise of a Messiah coming. And there, were, there was always a remnant of people that were just hoping that it would happen in their day. And they, they lived every day, even in the worst of times, hoping this would be the day. This would be the time that Christ would come to earth. And you can see the shepherds and Mary and Joseph and, and, and the wise men and all the people that were a part of realizing who Jesus was when that first coming, how excited they were. And now we live in a moment just like them. A moment of waiting, preparing. A moment that's been prophesied long ago that Jesus is going to come again. And we want to be ready for it. We want to be excited for it. We want to be uh, understanding what's involved in this. So uh, it's great timing for a sermon like this. Now, if you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, the first thing we see is the certainty of Christ's return. Because notice Paul says, when he comes. When he comes. When he comes. It's not if he comes, should he come. 
Could he come? No, it's, it's when he comes. And the way that is stated in the text is very important. And when you look at the context of why this letter was written, it was written to comfort people. It was written to give some hope and encouragement to some Christians who were struggling. Why? Why were they struggling? Because they were confused. They were upset. Like, they were, they were, they were uh, given some information that wasn't correct. And that, cor- that incorrect information really upset them. I, I think this information might upset you if you heard it today. If someone came to you and said, guess what? Jesus has already come. You missed it. Now, how many of you would be upset by that? How many would be troubled by that? Jesus came, and he went. And you missed it. How many of you would say, whoa? Right? Because you know what that means. If Jesus came a second time and he left, what does that mean? We're in the tribulation, right? We're in that seven-year period that the Bible describes as as unprecedented wrath and and trouble and trial for this world, right? That would would really kind of um, upset you. It would trouble you. It would, it, would, it would bring some, some fear, and that is what's happening in Thessalonica. Between the writing of the first letter and the second letter, some people have come in and told the Thessalonian Christians, you know why you're suffering all as you are? You know why you're, you know why you're going through all this persecution? It's because Jesus came back and you missed it. It shook them up. And so Paul is writing here in the second letter, Because he wants to remind these people that are confused and upset that Christ hasn't returned yet. You didn't miss it. And then the whole second chapter that we start next week, right, is going to tell about some of the events that lead up to Christ's return and what's involved in uh, the Antichrist and all that uh, that's prophesied about this man of sin, man of lawlessness, and what happens uh, when Jesus returns. So uh, it's extremely important. We know from Scripture that Christ's return is a very solidly established truth. In other words, there's more about Christ's second coming than there is his first coming, right? Um, there are a lot of texts. There's no doubt or speculation. So when Paul says when he comes, that's not mere speculation. That is complete a statement of confidence. There's no doubt about this. Think about Jesus' own words in John chapter 14, verse 3. Remember what he said? If I go and prepare a place for you, what? I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where, you, where I am, there you may be also. What did Jesus promise? I will what? Come again. Look at Acts 1.11. Here Jesus has ascended into heaven. The disciples are kind of watching him go up, and the, and. And they're kind of like standing there, staring there, and no more Jesus. Like, where did he go? He, he, he's not there. Jesus, Jesus just left us. And they're kind of standing there dumbfounded, and a, an angel comes to them and says, what? Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? You're wasting your time. Don't you remember what Jesus said? This same Jesus who was taken back in, taken from you into heaven will come back. Notice the will. He will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. So how is Jesus going to come back? The same way he was taken up. Now, some of, you, some of you science guys are going, well, that happened in Jerusalem. That happened in Israel. So we're on the other side of the earth. How's that going to be? Well, I, I have to tell you, I think the guy who created everything can accomplish it. Don't you? Don't you think you can, he can make himself seen by every person, even though the globe is the globe, that he is big enough and he can pull it off because he's the one that created everything so that every eye that will, that will behold him, right, that, that are following Jesus will know it's Jesus, right, when he comes. So that when he comes, it will be the same way 
that he left. Look at James chapter 5. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Revelation 3.11, Jesus himself saying, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Revelation 2.20, look at this. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. And then 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until he, the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden and expose the motives of hearts of men. And at that time, you will receive praise from God. So, we've all heard that saying, right? There are three things you can be certain of in life, right? You know what they are. You're going to be born. You're going to die. And then, what's the third one? You're going to pay taxes, right? Didn't, want to, didn't have to want to remind you about that, but that day is coming, right? Whenever you hear the first of the year, you know tax day is not too far away. But in this passage, there's a fourth assurance, isn't there? What is the fourth assurance? Jesus will come again. Just as life is certain, death is certain, taxes are certain, Christ's coming again is certain. And when he does, he's going to establish his kingdom rule on earth. He's going to assert his rule as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going to return and fulfill all the promises that he's made to every one of us in his word. Right? That's what's going to happen when Jesus returns. His certain return continues to be a source of our encouragement. Why? It means there is something better for us waiting for us. As good as life on earth has been for us, there is something better than this. Okay? That's encouragement. Because we've seen life gets a little more difficult, doesn't it? Life has getting, gotten more challenging in our world today. But the, the hope in all of this is this isn't the end. This isn't the end all of everything. We, we don't have to lay all of our cards in the basket of this world because... Our hope is fixed on things not seen, right? Our hope is fixed on Jesus Christ, where he's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. So um, our confidence is there's something better waiting for the us, and that comes because of the certainty of the Lord's return. And so with the first coming of Jesus that was promised long before it came to pass, we can be sure that if scriptures declare that Christ is coming, the precedent tells us that if he came the first time, right, and it was promised, that if he promised a second time, we can also believe that it will occur. So the, the, the second coming of Christ instills confidence in us, and it encourages us to be ready. So this is the first challenge, application of this message, message is, are you confident? Are you confident that Jesus is coming, and when he comes, he's coming for you? Secondly... Are you ready? Are you ready for Christ's return? Are you preparing yourself? Are you living as in a state of readiness? Ready to go. Ready to be called out of this world when Christ comes. Not so connected to this place that you couldn't give it up because your faith and your confidence is in Jesus Christ. Second thing, to be the confirmation of the saints. When he comes to be glorified in his saints... That's a loaded statement. We want to we unpack it. There are powerful implications in this thing. When he comes to be glorified in his saints. First, how will Jesus be glorified or appear to be recognized for all that he is in the persons of his saints? Here's the answer. Christ will be glorified or recognized for all he is through our obedience through our loyalty, through our faithfulness, through our faith to trust the words that He's communicated us, to us in Scripture. Jesus will be glorified through our endurance, through our willingness and strength that we draw from Him to endure persecution, trial, adversity, suffering, all the things that, that, that come to believers in this world and remain faithful to Him. That's how Christ will be glorified. He will be glorified in our worship. Our adoration. Our praise. And our affirmations. In all of life. 
that he is our personal Lord and Savior. That's how Christ is glorified, is when we worship him, when we praise his name, when we stand with, with, a, with a very thoughtful heart to worship the Lord. He's also glorified as he comes to claim us. Christ is glorified when he comes to claim his people, right? To acknowledge to the world that we belong to him. Christ will be glorified in the faith of his people when he comes to be glorified. You see, he will be glorified in honoring those who believed his word. I mean, Christ is looking for, Jesus is looking for people who believe his word. Believe what he said. And when he comes, he's going to be honored in those who took him at his word. Who didn't scoff at it, didn't mock at it, didn't say, oh, I don't believe that. Who were willing to take him and live by faith and trust in what the Bible taught and what, what it revealed to us about Jesus. He'll be glorified in that. He'll be glorified... Um, In life as disciples, we've identified with Jesus. He's going to identify with us. Most, most of you or some of you, uh, you see that little box over there. That's, that's our baptismal. And, and a lot of you, when you came to faith in Jesus Christ, what did you do? The, the first step after that, after you accepted Jesus, you repented of your sins, you, you were baptized. Why? Because you wanted to identify with Jesus Christ as your Savior. You wanted to do that in a public way. That's why we do baptism. That's why we do it for adults or believers. It could be a kid or a child, but as long as they have saving faith, they've expressed their faith in Jesus Christ to save them, we baptize them. Why? Because they want to identify with their Savior. And when you identify with your Savior, He identifies with you. He's glorified in by your profession of acknowledging Him when He comes. I mean, there's a verse in Scripture that talks about, you know, um, that if you're ashamed of Christ, He'll be ashamed of you. But if, but if, you're, if you acknowledge Him before men, which we, all, which we do, He'll acknowledge us before the Father. And that's what Jesus wants to do. That's how he's glorified in his saints. When he can pull us out of this world and present us as spotless children who've been bought and purchased with the blood of Christ to the Father, the God the Father in heaven. That's what Jesus is longing to do, be glorified in his saints. For those who are willing to forsake this world in, li in this life uh, for Jesus Christ. They're, win they're willing to abandon a, si abandon a sinful life in rebellion against God and be transformed by the gospel and living in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ will have the privilege of sharing in His glory. It's kind of like if you're on a really good basketball team and you have a really good player, right? And that player gets all the accolades. That player gets a lot. It's almost the whole team kind of rides in the glory of the person who did well, right? Well, Jesus is going to be glorified when he returns. And when we're connected to him by faith, we share in his glory, okay? So Christ is going to become and be glorified in his saints, right? But the question is, will Christ be glorified in my life? On the day that he returns. Because I'm living a life that demonstrates that I'm bringing honor and glory to him. That I trust him. That I'm walking by faith. Christ will be glorified in the lives of every person who's accepted him personally by faith. To be their savior and express their repentance of their sins. And trusted in Jesus' death as the payment for their sins on the cross. He'll be glorified in you if that's what you've done. You've committed your life to Jesus. He'll be glorified when I continue to stand unashamed of my being identified as a Christian, as a believer, as a disciple of Jesus. He'll be glorified in that when you stand firm for Jesus Christ. Now there's a very important, um, another little aspect of this to be glorified in His saints. 
And we don't want to miss that here. It's a very special designation that's given to everyone that's trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And this designation is something people really struggle with. They struggle to hear it. They struggle to grasp it. They struggle to realize it. And that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, if you belong to him, if you're a Christian, you are called a, you're called a saint. Get that? I want you to say that. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. I'm a saint. That's not, that's not what I say. That's what Jesus says. And when you look at it, the Apostle Paul uses this special title of designation so many times as he writes letters to churches. He did it to the Romans and Ephesians. He, I mean, you look at it. He talks about Christians being saints. And it's a special designation that applies to all believers. It's believers. It's not just a term of endearment, right? It's more than that. It's a statement of fact, and it's a title of identity. Okay, you're a saint. I'm a saint. I think we need to say that every day. We need to have that posted on our, on our mirror. We need to have that on a bracelet that goes around our, so that we can run. I'm a saint, right? I'm a saint. That title comes to me the moment I embrace Jesus as my Savior. The moment I become a Christian, I am a saint. I don't have to wait. and and Because you know, in certain other religious traditions, the saint is always that title that's reserved for very special people. And it's only given that title to them after they've died. But if you look at the scripture, Paul says every Christian is a saint. So there's St. Doug right there and St. Mark and St. Hannah, right? Saintus, I don't know. However you want to say that, right? That's what we become through the power of God in salvation. And, you know, this is nothing to fear or be ashamed of, being called a saint, right? It's nothing to hide. Just as Jesus said, uh, you know, you don't put a bushel back basket over your light, right? Over your saintliness, you, you let that shine for all the world to see that I'm a saint, right? That's not what I've called myself because people will beg to differ with you, right, sometimes? If that was my designation, hey, I'm St. John. You don't live like St. John sometimes. Well, I have to tell you, even though sometimes I don't live like St. John, that's what God calls me. He calls me St. John. That's what Jesus calls me, is St. John. I didn't choose that designation. He gave me that designation. He honored me with that designation. It's a mark or a, and I cherish that we should cherish because it's God's mark on our life because of the power of Jesus Christ. And it's definitely a mark that if we allow to truly represent our life, has the power in Jesus to transform the lives of other people around us. When we live like, when we embrace our saintliness, being set apart, being saved, being sanctified, when we, when we embrace that, when, when we're happy with that, when we're satisfied with being saints, you know what happens to our life? It takes on a whole new meaning. That when saintliness rubs off, it inspires other people. People, let your light, let your saintliness so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are to enjoy the blessings that come to our life being set apart, saints by calling. We're to enjoy that. And I ask you, are you enjoying being a saint? Are you enjoying it? Are you drawing from the life of the Holy Spirit in you to produce those saintly qualities that the world can see that Jesus makes a difference. What you, Christ makes a difference in my life. He's identified me for saintliness through the good news of salvation that I've received through faith. Got to keep going. So that's, that's part of the, the celebration, to be glorified in his saints. But notice there's a celebration to be marveled at among all who have believed. Now, for every disciple of Jesus Christ, 
the celebration of his return will be of uncelebrated proportions. No, the magnitude of this is going to be very significant. He's going to be glorified in his saints among all who believe. Every person that's believed is going to celebrate when Jesus returns. And this is, this is nothing that we've ever experienced in the way of celebration ever in life. Paul says the believer will marvel in it. Okay, We're going to marvel in it. We're going to stand in awe. We're going to be going, whoa! Think about it. If you see Jesus burst, if you hear the trumpet blow, if you hear Christ calling your name, you're going to be going, yes! Right? I think so. That will be the first time some of you ever show any emotion in worship. Yes! I know you can do it because you do it at ball games all the time. Yeah! And in church it says, yay Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Your grace still finds me. Yeah, right? I, I'm a, just, just kidding. I mean, just getting on you a little bit. Because, I mean, we, we get excited about a lot of things. But we're going to get really excited about this. Now, I, I don't know. Anybody who's watched Storage Wars on TV? This is, this is called reality TV. I, 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 I kind of laugh at what reality TV's become. You know, these, these, they have these actors that are called reality TV stars, right? And, and they put them on the show, and they buy these lockers, right? These lockers, these storage lockers. And they, it's, it's a bit of a gamble, right? Because you, you never know if you're going to get a clunker that you spend thousands of dollars and you can't get your money back and selling it at your thrift store somewhere in California, right? And uh, somebody let the cat out of the bag a few years ago by saying, to make the show more interesting, right, the, the producers put in some expensive items into junky lockers so that it would make the show more interesting. So much for reality TV, right? But there's this guy on the show. You know him. His name is Daryl Sheets. Big old Daryl, right? Daryl is no short on confidence, is he? He's that guy... It brings the water bill, and he's always looking for what? Come on. The wow factor, isn't he? The wow factor. Hey, Brando, this might be the wow factor. What is the wow factor? The wow factor is buying some cheap locker for 100 bucks and finding there's $10,000 stowed in this little locker in memorabilia or in, in some little trinket that's worth extreme value uh, that was sort of just happened to be left there by some dummy who didn't figure out what it was worth or by the producers of the show that wanted to make a good published you know, thing, right? But I want to tell you, the ultimate wow factor is not what Daryl Sheets finds on Storage War. It is the return of Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate wow factor. And Paul says that, to be glorified in his saints, who will marvel at him when he comes. To be marveled at, at all who believe. No one who belongs to Jesus Christ will be disappointed when he returns. when we see the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know what? The Bible really encourages us that we're to live in anticipation of this day every day of our life. Live in anticipation of this wow factor moment. Paul even says that a crown of righteousness is going to be given to those who have loved his appearing. Those who were just so excited for Jesus to return. Folks, we are a bride in waiting. We're a bride. Okay? We're the bride of Christ, if you're a Christian. We are a bride in waiting. And we are waiting for what every bride anticipates. What is it? Your wedding day, right? And what is interesting about wedding days in the Bible is the men, the men get this, the men plan the wedding day in the Bible. If men were responsible for planning weddings today, there wouldn't be weddings, right? 
Let's go over to the gas station and get married, you know? Something like that, wouldn't it? If a man was planning it. Go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and let them, you know, cater the meal. That's a man thing, right? But in the Bible, the men did a tremendous job. They spent a whole year or more planning for the wedding day. They got the home ready. They got everything ready so that when it was the ultimate wedding day, it would be the ultimate of all ultimates. It would, it would be a blessing. It would be the, the greatest. And the groom just looked forward to that day, on that wedding day, when he could, when he could take his bride and bring her and present her to all the people came to the wedding so he could be so show how proud how how excited that he was that his bride he he could he could show his his bride to to those who were at the wedding feast and jesus is longing for the day he's planning the wedding feast right now okay he's planning it he's getting ready and when he comes, he's going to gather us up, right? He's going to gather all of, his, all of his saints together. And he is going to escort all of us into the presence of God where he will present to God. And he will say, Heavenly Father, this is my bride. And that bride is going to be clothed in the wonderful, pure righteousness of Jesus Christ. All of our sins have been cleansed and covered and atoned for. And we're going to be standing and Jesus is going to say, this is my treasured bride. These are the saints from all the angels, Heavenly Father. We are here to celebrate the wedding. That's the picture of Scripture. And a lot of times, you know, I go to weddings and, you know, the, the celebrations, I, I, I kind of try to put a little spin on it for people because I know what's going to happen at the wedding celebration isn't quite what I think Jesus has in mind, right? At many, at many receptions. But at this reception, Jesus is, there's going to be a grand march. And Christ is going to escort all of us in. And he's going to look at the Father and he's going to say, here is my bride. Here are the saints. Here are the people who believed. Here are the people who, who didn't deny my word. Here are the people that, that remained firm and faithful to the very end. And, and they waited for this wedding day. And they knew and they persevered through some very hard times, never giving up their hope that this day was coming. They kept themselves pure and they confessed their sins and they, they were ready for that day. Folks, that's the ultimate wall factor. That is the ultimate day that, that you will ever experience in your whole life is when Jesus returns to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at on that day. And look at the cause of this. I'm just going to close with that. It's, I know it's gone long today, but for our te testimony to you was believed. Why did this happen? Because you believed. You believed. You trusted the message. You put your faith in the message. You trusted in Christ. I was watching this video a few weeks ago, and I, I noticed this little clip. There's a guy out in the street of London, and he decided to do a little experiment. He printed up this piece of paper, right? And I've been to Chicago, big cities. There are always people, people peddling things on the street, passing things out, right? Well, this guy decided to put, and he printed on this piece of paper, a five-pound note of British currency, a little picture of it on this piece of paper. And it had a, a message, Bring it to me, and I'll give you five pounds, right? Give it to me, and I'll bring you five pounds. That's what was on the piece of paper. Now, he did an experiment. How many people do you think actually took the piece of paper and came and got the money from him? Very few. People saw him, saw him, hey, 
See people saw him? Mm. Too good to be true. Quite an interesting experience. Many people just ignored the guy. They wouldn't take the paper. A few people looked at the paper and found it too good to be true and threw it away, very skeptical of the offer. Very few read the paper, believed the message that was communicated. Very few received the gift of the five pounds that he was offering. All you have to do is return the paper to me and I'll give it to you. Why? Because they they didn't have the faith to trust that the offer was true. And this is pretty much a metaphor of life for many when it comes to the gospel. It's kind of interesting how this place was filled on Christmas Eve. We we could already get more people in here. It was so packed. Some people, that was their only attendance for the whole year. And it's amazing why people go to church on, why do you pick Christmas or, or Easter? You hear the same message every year, but do you believe it? Do you embrace it? Or is it like the guy in the street? You know what he's going to say. And I'm not going to believe it. It's too good to be true. It's going to cramp my style. That's what I expect them to say. I've heard that message before. Big deal. Or are you going to be that person who reaches out and receives a wonderful, the most valuable gift you could ever receive in life, and that is eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what God is offering. But it's amazing how many people look at the paper and they say, I don't want it. I don't think I need that. That's that religious stuff. I don't know if I care for that. Jesus wasn't offering religion. He was offering himself to you in a relationship. He came to give himself to us to die so that we could be established, reestablished in a broken relationship that existed between God and us. And we had no power to change that. It could only be changed through a perfect sacrifice. And Jesus gave that so that we could be reconciled to God and that we could be reconciled to one another. So, what about you? You can't read the scriptures without seeing the value it places on personal faith and the reward that it receives from God. Being included in the festivities associated with Christ's return requires personal faith in the gospel. If you want Jesus to call your name, if you want to be considered in the pool of saints that are part of the bridal party that is welcomed into the presence of God... Escorted by the Lord Jesus Christ, it calls for a personal faith in Jesus Christ. It calls for me to renounce my sins and to trust in Jesus to save me. It isn't about going to church. It isn't about being a religious person. It is about embracing a Savior who's died for you that you allow to come into your life to transform you. So I'd just like you to bow your heads and close your eyes and We've talked about the second Christmas, and all I can say is, are you ready for it because you've accepted Christ? Are you preparing for it because you know Jesus and you are having your eyes focused on him? You know, we're coming up on another new year. What kind of spiritual changes are you going to make in your life? Everybody talks about New Year's resolutions. I'm going to ask you this morning, what kind of spiritual resolutions do you need to make to to prepare yourselves for the day when Christ comes. Maybe the resolution starts today with accepting Jesus Christ to be your Savior, to give, to to allow yourself, you know, to receive that gift that God has given to you by faith, believing the message, trusting that Jesus came to die for your sins. Maybe you're a Christian and you're just kind of struggling, walking through life. You kind of hung up on a lot of problems and issues, just kind of unfulfilled, unsatisfied. Nothing really satisfies you in life. You're just, you're just kind of just existing. Maybe it's time for a 
spiritual change that takes place in your life today when you take Jesus serious and you take that title that he's given to you. You're a saint. You're a saint. You're a saint by calling. You're set apart. And you're willing to say, Jesus, I need your help to free me from some of the sins that so easily entangle my life. And I'm just going all in for you. I'm just going to give my all to you this morning. If we do that, if we commit our life to Christ, He said He'll come in. He'll come in. And I don't know where you're at this morning, but I ask that you give Jesus a chance. He's the answer to all of our problems. Jesus is the answer. To all of our struggles, Jesus is the answer. And you say, well, Pastor, that's just way too simplistic. Too many people don't try it. Don't get into the Word. Don't listen to what Jesus wants to say to them and how He wants to direct their life and how He wants to show them the complete satisfaction that He can only give to you if you're willing to trust trust in Him and walk with Him. And so as we just play a song this morning, if... God has spoken to your heart and you need prayer this morning for a spiritual change, a spiritual turn of direction. Maybe it's to embrace sainthood. Maybe it's to embrace the gospel of Jesus. And you'd like to come and pray. Would you come?